compound in the brain that elicited Mr. Hill experience. I think there may be a role for DMT in explaining any number of hallucinatory phenomena you know, that man has experienced you know, throughout his history. Creativity, imagination, dream states, changes that occur due to isolation, trauma, starvation, uh, all of which produce hallucinatory phenomena. These hallucinatory phenomena are explainable by the presence of compounds known to produce hallucinations. And the only compounds that we know of that are capable of doing this are the class of compounds known as hallucinogens. When thinking about spiritual states, I think endogenous hallucinogenic compounds and molecules that the brain can potentially release are probably very relevant to this topic because on one hand, they may really help us to elucidate what is the neurochemical mechanism of these experiences. I mean, if we can say that there's a release of endogenous opiates or we can say that there's a release of dopamine or something like that, and we can measure that release and we can see where in the brain those different molecules go, what receptors they activate or deactivate, and hence we can really learn a lot more about what these experiences are because it really can allow us to match up these experiences that people have with hallucinogens as well as understanding where they are related in the context of the brain's receptors and, and the different parts of the brain that can, may or may not become active. One of the other interesting things about the pharmacology of DMT is that it's actively transported into the brain. And so you have to wonder about the role of DMT in just everyday normal perceptual, you know, um, activity. You know, um, too much DMT and things become very psychedelic or, you know, not enough, uh, you know, DMT in the brain can make things dull and flat and gray. There's something that for me makes sense about DMT, you called it the spirit molecule, it might almost be called, you know, the reality molecule. Philosophically, it makes sense that something that would be so fundamental to um, the way we perceive reality would be imbued out there in reality. There was a sense around it that there was something special, that, that it wasn't uh, like anything else, there wasn't like other uh, psychedelics. Its intensity and speed was such that it really produced a different kind of uh, response. I mean, I remember almost getting the sense that it was kind of like a, like a psychedelic bungee jump, that there was a kind of raw leap into this rapidly changing environment that was very different than the more gradual approaches uh, of other psychedelics. And smoke DMT is sort of like the drive-by shooting of psychedelics. You're in one place, bang, you're in another place, and then bang, you're back down. So it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for that narrative of who am I, what am I doing here, why am I in this space, what am I learning? It's almost like there was too much information to process in that few minute span to integrate once you drop back down. Dimethyltryptamine, when it's administered, has a very rapid onset and a very short duration of action. This is because it's very rapidly broken down by the body so that it can be cleared. DMT is rapidly degraded by an enzyme in the liver called monoamine oxidase, or MAO. That's the reason it's not active when you take it by mouth. Whereas psilocybin, when you take it by mouth, it's not broken down by monoamine oxidase very quickly at all. So it, it gets through the liver and passes on into the bloodstream and into the brain. Yeah, I'm very interested in ayahuasca. When I began my studies in the early 1990s, ayahuasca was just starting to make inroads into the West, but it's obviously become a lot more popular in the last 10, 15 years. And the visionary ingredient in ayahuasca is DMT. Through some amazing feat of pre-literate chemistry, the Amazonian natives stumbled upon or combined whatever. Um, I don't know how they did it, but they 
found that one plant contains DMT and one plant contains an enzyme inhibitor. Combine them, you can drink DMT and it's orally active. So it starts working in a half hour, lasts for three or four hours. And um, you can you know, maneuver a lot more comfortably within that state than you can when you're just smoking it or injecting it. Orally active ayahuasca tends to pick you up and gently carry you into the space and hug you and embrace you and clean you and show you all sorts of mystical visions. And then it very gently brings you back down, like you're floating on a feather back to the ground. As valuable as my DMT experiences have been, I um, feel that there's a lot more enduring value, really, in this uh, folk technology, which stretches it out and makes it a navigable space. Our whole Western, you know, European-derived tradition of distilling alcohols and isolating chemicals and making everything stronger and taking it out of nature and putting it into the biggest punch that we can, I don't think that generally that's the most useful way. I think there's a reason that cultures have uh, learned to turn a five-minute experience into a five-hour experience. It seems to me that ayahuasca has had a plan and that it's reached out into the world and brought DMT into many, many thousands of lives in a much bigger uh, canvas than it had reached for the last 10,000 or however many years. And it's done it very rapidly and it's done it with form to go with it. And ayahuasca is much harder for the power structures that we have now, it's much harder for them to put down because it has been part of a legitimate religious and spiritual practice for thousands of years, certain, certainly in the Amazon. Uh, and and we, can't just, uh, we can't just dismiss all that as primitive mumbo jumbo and, and superstition. We have, to, we have to get to grips with that on its, on its own terms. I think that there's a, a growing number of people who, who feel this uh, desire to uh, get back in touch with nature, with plants, with animals, and who know that uh, through the shamanic path there is a way of doing this, and that actually these, uh, these tools, these psychoactive tools for plants like uh, ayahuasca is a very uh, direct way of doing this. Now, it may not be everybody's cup of tea, and I think a lot of people are uh, uh, actually with reason afraid of it. I think like a lot of people in my generation, I first heard about DMT through Terence McKenna. And it was a very funny way to uh, become aware of such uh, powerful and interesting uh, and anthropologically rich uh, topic as a, a compound like DMT because it really became more, it was almost more of a concept than, than something that people were necessarily taking. The DMT flash makes it clear that uh, disembodied consciousness is a possibility. I think that the whole tension of history and the tension of life seems to be about the shedding of the body. Terence was uh, very, he was a good promoter. Basically, he said it's, it's the ultimate metaphysical reality pill. And even though it's not a pill, but uh, I thought that was a pretty good characterization after I took it. It seemed to be uh, of a different order than LSD and mescaline and some of the other things that were around. DMT really did seem to be a, uh, a whole other level of experience. I ask that you suspend any opinions, either negative or positive, about these compounds. Whatever you believe their value to be, they continue to have profound effects wherever we find their use, whether it's contemporary Western culture or in the Amazon rainforest. It was in the 50s that the ayahuasca churches started come, going public. You know, that from, there was a kind of a transition from the in, 
indigenous Indians in South America, to, to the mestizo people in the cities, and then these churches, you know, the Santo Daime Church, and then the UDV Church a little later started doing ceremonies that would made the ayahuasca accessible not just to Indians, but to urban people in the big cities in Brazil who are as far from the shamans as we are. In the early 1990s, the UDV established a branch uh, of their church in the United States. In the late 90s, um, the U.S. Uh, Customs Department, along with the DEA, intercepted a shipment of ayahuasca. The church um, uh, protested the government action. They contended that it violated the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and the case was heard in the U.S. Supreme Court. And in February 2006, their decision was announced, and it was a unanimous decision uh, on the side of the UDV. Why is it that in the entire Western world, these substances that uh, have been found to be so interesting by uh, hundreds of cultures for thousands of years are prohibited? How did these cultures that consider themselves to be enlightened, democratic, and scientific get to declaring plants illegal? It can seem weird, but there's clearly something deep and revealing about the nature of these societies. Our society values alert problem-solving consciousness, and it devalues all other states of consciousness. Any kind of consciousness that is not related to the production or consumption of material goods is stigmatized in our society today. Of course, we accept drunkenness. We allow people some brief respite from the material grind. A society that subscribes to that model is a society that is going to condemn states of consciousness that have nothing to do with the alert problem-solving mentality. And if you go back to the 1960s, when there was you know, a tremendous upsurge of exploration of psychedelics, I would say that the huge backlash that, that followed that had to do with a fear on the part of the powers that be, that if enough people went into those realms and those experiences, the very fabric of the society we have today would be picked apart, and most importantly, those in power at the top would not be in power at the top anymore. There was an optimism that was, was ungrounded, you know, that the Vietnam was happening, that all this real stuff was going on, and that the psychedelic movement wasn't really addressing that in a real way, and that Timothy and that, that bunch sold us a false uh, a bill of goods that didn't really work. So we are now, whether we like it or not, in the psychochemical age. In the future, it's not going to be what book you read. It's going to be what chemicals do you use to open or close your consciousness. Chemicals can help us learn faster. Chemicals can help us expand or contract our consciousness. The atmosphere in the 1960s was we are doing research here. We are dedicating our lives to trying just about everything on the planet. So we would try it, then we would talk about it, then we would evaluate it. We regarded ourselves more or less as spiritual pioneers. I mean, the way I look at the 60s, you can see it as a um, kind of failed attempt at, at a mass cultural voyage of initiation. You know, so people would, would you know, tried to go out into these other realities, but they didn't have a basis for it. There weren't uh, wisdom traditions, and elders, there weren't like connections of shamanic lineages. So people would grow out and they would kind of like smash apart. Timothy Leary really so discredited a scientific approach to studying this, because he, I mean, he started off doing interesting research and then got into advocating use in a way that was incredibly threatening. Culturally, we reacted, and, um, and politically, uh, it became impossible to do this uh, sort of research. Funding agencies didn't make resources available. Regulatory agencies increased the uh, practical hurdles for initiating this kind of research, and I think people who had interest in research 
of this type largely um, were discredited because of their interest in the research. Social, political, scientific issues that came together pushed these drugs out of the scientific marketplace. The public opinion in many cases had become that psychedelic research was dangerous. Uh, the lay public was uninformed about the true nature of these compounds and what their importance may be in the understanding of perception itself. One of the tragedies to me is that the clinical research on these substances pretty much stopped around 1970. And for me, it, it, it's especially tragic because I, I really believe that these substances played a major role in the development of our philosophy and thinking throughout the world. What a lot of people don't realize is that psychiatry up until the 50s, the field in general had no concept that neurochemistry played any role in emotion or behavior, which today seems really bizarre. And the discovery of LSD and its potent effects on, on the human psyche occurred almost contemporaneously with the discovery of serotonin as a molecule in the brain. And it was really when people looked at the structure of serotonin and compared it with LSD that they really began to think, you know, maybe neurochemistry plays a role in brain chemistry and, and behavioral states. If LSD had not been discovered, I doubt we would have had any of the drugs we have, at least not as quickly as we do for treating depression and so forth. Once these drugs uh, became abused and uh, scandalized, um, psychiatry had to really work hard, um, you know, to distance themselves from any valid scientific, you know, scientifically meritorious relationship with psychedelics. Being a psychiatrist and saying you want to learn or study about psychedelics, it's, you know, it's not that well received. And uh, I, I made one mention one time and was discouraged from really bringing it up again for actually a number of years. For cultural reasons, the whole class of compounds got pulled off the, the clinical bench and no research has gone on for 40 years. So scientifically, I, I can't imagine a more exciting area to be pursuing. How does one go about studying these plants and compounds? Plants and compounds which produce unimaginable experiences and appear to shed light on some of humanity's greatest mysteries. In order to answer that question, Dr. Strassman conducted the first human psychedelic research in a generation. One of the things that I had established early on was being able to discriminate between studies in uh, the scientific realm and recreational use. But in the early 1980s, I reviewed all of that literature and could pretty well establish on that if people were really carefully screened and supervised and then followed up that the incidence of adverse reactions to LSD and related psychedelic drugs was extremely low. The drug or the compound or the chemical that seemed like the best candidate to sort of reopen um, the U.S. Uh, front on psychedelic research would be DMT. It was really, I mean, it's exciting for me because I thought this is the first study in a generation and not only that, despite the fact that DMT had been used safely in earlier studies and it was this natural component of the brain, DMT is one of the most profound and potent psychedelics known. So it wasn't just an initiation of clinical research, it was a reinitiation of clinical search with an extremely potent drug. I was of the strong opinion uh, that you could do these studies and, and Rick agreed. So we had a number of discussions and at some point the, the discussion came up, you know, Dave, what if I do all this paperwork and spend all this time and get to the end of things and I'm ready to go and I can't get the DMT. And that was a real possibility because the DMT, clinical grade DMT, wasn't the chemical you could just buy off the shelf somewhere. And I told Rick, if you get to that point and no one will make it, then I'll do it. And ultimately, Rick got to that point, and I made it. The design of the study was fairly straightforward. Give people DMT and measure as many variables as possible. I, I had to sort of anticipate a lot of objections that would come my way uh, from the regulatory agencies that oversee this kind of research. So at that point began a two-year process of dealing with um, 
Not that many regulatory agencies, but uh, fairly monolithic ones. One sort of a, you know, sidelight of the protocol was the involvement of a psychiatrist from UCLA named um, Daniel Friedman. Um, he was a, kind of one of the grand old men of American psychiatry. And actually, he was one of the people who, in the 50s and 60s, got their start with psychedelic research. And the main thing that uh, Danny Friedman uh, told Rick, told us, was don't even get close to psychotherapy. Forget about treating mental illness or alcoholism or anything. Forget that. That's where all the hysteria is. That's where all the fears get up. You're a scientist, Rick. Approach it as a scientist. Do basic, simple measurements. Look at heart rate, cardiovascular parameters. You won't get in trouble doing that. You can get it funded, and it's solid science. Rick did what he said, but then he still was able to get these, you know, accounts of what happened. And that wasn't in the plan. That wasn't really what was proposed in the studies that were funded, and that wasn't what uh, Danny talked about. But those were the spinoff that was that really made it interesting. Rick Strassman was advertising in some magazine somewhere about wanting volunteers for a particular study in um, in a psychotropic, and I didn't really know what, I didn't know DMT from STP at that time. And I remember reading that and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is bad. I better get involved in this and, and make sure that, uh, you know, somebody doesn't get hurt and, and that at least, you know, there'd be some sensitivity towards what this stuff is really about. I met Rick's research nurse at a, a party and she heard me talking about that I had used um, peyote ceremonially and she took me aside and said uh, there's something that you might be interested in we're looking for subjects volunteer subjects for uh, some unusual research I was a little concerned that the the study participants might be a little um, obnoxious I, I maybe that's not the right word but you know people that were just seeking to do a lot of drugs and uh, they were um, very professional people um, there were varying degrees as to how much um, hallucinogen use they had um, been through, it seemed like. There were some people that fe it felt like they had made it their kind of their life mission to experience every kind of substance out there. And then other people who um, I think were just interesting for their own, interested for their own personal growth and um, yeah, our curiosity. Once we actually got into the preparation for the actual trips, Rick asked me uh, about roller coasters. Do you like roller coasters? You know, the sensation of going up really high and then slamming back down towards Earth. And I said, no, I hate them. They're horrible. And he said, not good. I just wanted to go with the experience, learn as much as I could, absorb as much as I could, and be humble to it. The idea of legally sanctioned psychedelics was just very compelling. Plus, you're in a hospital. So should you get that uncomfortable experience that you're dying, you're with doctors in a very safe environment from that point of view. I mean, this was really very cutting edge, very out there, very, it was high risk. And uh, people knew what they were getting into and they wanted to have the extra reassurance. And I was glad, actually, to have a crash cart in the room and. A, team, you know, in the hospital to respond to any emergencies. You're in this hospital room and there's all the sounds and the smells and just the the prior experiences of being in the hospital, you know, all these negative things come back. So there was the the, the whole environment to be overcome because little did I know that it didn't matter where I was. I wasn't going to be in my body. I was going to be out in the universe and it didn't matter where you launched from. It could be a hospital room. It could be the jungle in the Amazon. It didn't matter where you were because you weren't going to stay there. Set and setting is so important. It's even more important than the substance. More important than the substance. Set and setting is everything. Now, what is the set and setting when you are blindfolded? The set and setting is not what you're seeing. You're not seeing anything. The set and setting is your internal self. The things that you have learned, the capacities that you have achieved, the conditions of your own psyche and psychology, these are your set and setting. 
It's the medicine combined with or interacting with the set and setting that creates an effect of safety, of trust, of comfort, and of resourcefulness that makes it possible for you to take some big leaps and receive some big gifts. And if that's not there, you just get terrified. So I, was, I didn't really have physical fears so much that they would die or have a stroke. Um, I did have some fears about people's mental health, you know, um, especially with some of the higher doses. We gave one gentleman who had had a lot of experience with the drug one dose, and he didn't think it, it took him far enough. So then we gave him a higher dose, and uh, he was gone. He was really gone. It, it reminded me of something from The Exorcist. I mean, he just, just, boom, sat bolt up in the bed, and his eyes opened up, and he, they were completely dilated and black. And I almost thought he was going to turn his head completely around. And I remember looking at Rick, and Rick looked at me, and I thought, oh my God, he's gone. I hope he comes back. And he did. The countdown was like, you know, cutting down for your, preparing for your death, like waiting to surrender. And you'd feel the coldness and it, the coldness just going through your veins. And it's really indescribable. It's hard to, you know, it's like ice going through your veins. And the next thing that would happen besides my racing heart is this burning sensation would happen on the back of my neck. I mean, this was reliable. This is like clockwork. This happened every time that you, that you shot me up with DMT. And then there'd be a hum, and the hum would get louder and louder, and to the point where it broke apart everything that I was or knew. It was just this it just got louder and louder until you just had to surrender to the sound. And then you were there. I would get a warm, full feeling, a golden feeling in my chest before it went to my head. And I'd feel this warm rod about an inch and a half in diameter start growing up inside my central channel. It would come up and sort of slow, warm up my chest, go up through my head, and slow down and put tremendous pressure in my sinuses behind my eyes, and slow down. It start to grow and distend the skin behind my forehead about one inch, behind my hairline. And when it had, I was afraid it was gonna pop my skin a few times, because it was a very physical feeling. About an inch and a half, two inches above my skull, when it popped through there, then the psychedelic trip would start. I thought I died. I saw the white clouds, uh, you know, the uh, Renaissance white fluffy clouds with the gods and the angels and all that stuff is what I saw. I thought I was dying and going out, but I did take a quick look at Cindy and a quick look at Rick because I had my eyes open and they were both there watching, looking very calm. And I go, oh, that's really good news. My body looks fine. So I didn't know whether it was my birth I was re-experiencing, my death which was yet to come, because I, I know that time crumbles. The linearity of time is totally meaningless in these states. You are at the godhead, the point where all time folds in on itself. More and more layers of my humanity start peeling off. Finally, the last you know, the, almost the last layer, and I can't even describe what it is, but you have, at some reaches way in there, there is like the last layer of that which you, which defines you as a human being, and it goes click. You are no longer a human being. In fact, you're no longer anything you can identify. There is no concept of time. It was so disorienting. I was so terrified. I have never in my entire life been so terrified to be blasted out of my body, to leave my body behind, to be going at warp speed backwards through my own DNA, out the other end, into the universe. And so I went right into this white light. As soon as I went into it, I lost 
any sense of being different, any sense of what I was doing, past, any sense of future. Uh, it was absolutely blissful and euphoric. And I just felt like it wasn't I. I was everything. I was the light. There was no sense of separation, no shadows, no differences, no past, no future. It was all present and white to yellow light. Then I felt myself falling out of this light. And as I fell out of it, I could feel the light was like a glow, like the sun with flames coming out and lapping out. And I could already start to feel this tremendous separation. I reached across and it was suddenly I'm in the universe in this huge void with these beings on the other side and I put out my hands and this incredible rainbow of pink light went between me and these entities and I was trying to make it be like a white light but it was this incredible pink light this energy of love that we this capacity of love that we as human beings have that I was trying to just send to them. This meteor-like trip through, through the infinite space of the interior consciousness is up pops the picture puzzle pattern door. And I'm now whizzing through this sucker like if it was nothing. It's just I'm flying through it. But now I know what the picture puzzle pattern door is. The picture puzzle pattern door is the farthest reaches of your humanity. This is the doorway into the what defines you as a human being. When you go past that, you stop being human to a degree. And the further you get past this point, the further away you go from being a human being. But right here, this picture puzzle pattern door is everything. It's everything. It's what defines you as a human being. This is your, this picture puzzle pattern door is you. This is like the actual core of where all of reality is emanating from. This is where meaning comes from. Symbols were pouring out. They were intertwined. Every symbol or and letter and in every language was pouring out of this point. And I looked around at my environment and I was trying to absorb everything to understand, but there were all of these machines or structures or things that that I had never seen before, that I had no idea what they were. I was like a caveman in a computer lab. I didn't have any idea, but I knew in my intellectual awareness that this was a very advanced civilization or life forms or, or whatever they were. They, they were so far advanced from, from what we know here on Earth. There's one state of in it, I call it the, the hobby horses. And they're interlocking, reticulating, uh, vibrating hobby horses. And I use that, that's what they seem like to me. They interlock and they form a, a visual pattern that seems infinite in scape. And then you're on the inside, outside, inside, every side. And so it's less possible to use, um, you know, words start to, start to escape you. The texture of the space was very much like an animated Mexican tile. It seemed to be hyper vivid in color, in the technicolor sense, but also very clay-like and earth, you know, like with an earthen pointing towards earth, but not really being of earth. And there was no I, there was just a sense of a witness being suspended in this incredible vaulted space, like a cathedral made uh, out of a stained glass of all imaginable colors, unbelievable brilliance and saturation of color, just this amazing pattern in this dome, this gigantic dome. It was it felt like you know the size of the, the of a small planet. And there were these winged beings. I don't remember exactly what they were, but were like 
angels, something like angels, that were majestically kind of flying through the space. But there was something about the quality of how they were flying that was unique. I'd never seen anything like it. It was like, I don't know, a sense of uh, another realm that was there. My sense was at, at some point, there was this implicit sense, this is the divine realm. This is the divine realm. And it, it was not like a thought, but it was like this implicit kind of grokking recognition. It was all very, very impersonal until I got to the space where I realized that I was in the area where souls await rebirth. And I was there and I had been there so many times before I recognized it and this incredible transcendent peace came over me. I have never in my life ever felt such peace. Everything was stripped away. Every hope, every fear, every attachment to the material world was completely stripped out of me. I was free to just be the essence of a soul. After the medicine wore off, uh, there is that familiar sensation of kind of coming back into the body. And I do remember that. That was part of almost all of those experiences of kind of coalescing back into sensory awareness and a sense of having a body and of that becoming a little more substantial. And then say, oh yeah, here I am. And I live in a body and I'm okay. So Laura removes the eye shades and I ask, not really with my eyes open quite yet. I ask, how long was I gone? Because I needed to know. And Rick chimes in like 15 minutes. For a moment, I'm shocked. I'm like, you know, the mind, you know, has to try to catch up because now the whole cognitive dissonance of the experience has to has to catch up. I was gone for 15 minutes. A thousand years of experience in 15 minutes. Well, to say the least, it, it was profound. It, it was, it was profound. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing what a human being can experience um, in a hospital bed. I mean, they can experience almost the whole universe. You know, life, death, everything in between. This is not some recreational thing. And I don't believe anybody should enter this lightly. It is life transformative. It will perhaps shake you enough to realize you know, that you need to be awake to the fact that you don't know, and that is the beginning of starting to know. What we see here is such a tiny part of what is real. I get really frustrated because, of course, there's no way to prove that where I went was deep space, that I encountered, you know, other entities, other life forms that exist in this universe. At some point, maybe our civilization will become advanced enough and we will throw off these anchors of impossible thought that these things are impossible, that it's, it's not, you know, that they're, everything that exists exists where we can see it. I wrapped up the studies in 95 and uh, really just had to take a break for a couple of years. I was aware of a growing sense of discomfort uh, with what I was doing because I just couldn't explain it. And it uh, seemed to me if I couldn't model and explain what was going on that I was doing and just, uh, you know, bringing people to the edge of these kinds of experiences, it seemed like I ought to. Um, that it was a little irresponsible to be sort of pushing people off the cliff like that without really knowing exactly what it was and accepting and understanding and feeling comfortable with, with that model. And, um, you know, I think what began dawning on me after a while once I stopped the study was that I was really dealing with a spiritual phenomenon. 
What do these experiences say about the nature of reality, the nature of our minds, or the function of our brain that we can so quickly shift into these alternate realities? Let's take a step back and consider how these experiences inform us about ourselves, our consciousness, and the symbiosis of the two. It started seeming to me that, was, that what was happening with DMT, uh, particularly with respect to uh, some of these reports of entering parallel or alternate or freestanding parallel sorts of realms of existence is that that indeed was what their consciousness was doing. The chemistry of their brain, which is the organ of consciousness, was being changed by DMT in such a way that they could then receive information that we weren't able to receive normally. Yes, there's the experiences from DMT and ayahuasca and they have their, their function. But if we we'll also look at what it enables us to see. It just rips that filtering mechanism away for a few minutes. And for a few minutes, you're immersed in sort of this raw data sphere of input, of sensory input, of memories, of associations. I mean, it seems like uh, the brain builds reality out of these things, what you're experiencing, what you have experienced, and how you associate and synthesize these things together to tell yourself a story, essentially, about what, what's going on, where you are in space and time. It's the brain that helps us to process all this information and to create for us a rendition of what our world is all about. But we're trapped within that brain. However, in spiritual experiences where people feel that they get beyond the self, in certain types of psychedelic experiences where you have incredible sensory and other types of phenomena, uh, people really feel like they are able to kind of get outside of their brain. We have to take a very big look at what is going on within them when they have the experience and try to understand how it happens physiologically and try to make sense of it from the subjective perspective as well as from the objective perspective. I don't think you can just say, let's just explain it away on the basis of science. What I was doing early on when I was hearing these, these reports were interpreting them, calling them psychological or uh, brain chemistry aberrations or whatever, um, that there was a part of the brain that was being dinged that was responsible for the alien appearance phenomenon. This is not a new phenomenon. Uh, entities in altered states you know, have been recognized for an extremely long time in many cultures over the millennia. Helpers, spirit assistants, angels, all of these, these different entities have been fairly common throughout uh, man's experience of altered states and through much of man's mythology. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that people are in some way interacting with some sort of an intelligence or sentient being or something that exists at some level that's not in this three-dimensional physical plane. I'm looking at it from a sense of, okay, is the, is the drug healing you? Is it helping you? And, and or is it, is it giving you the tools? What are you bringing back? What you bring back, I think, has to be something more than there are these entities out there. The best psychedelic explorers are people who realize that even the truths they see on a trip are not truths, but new models, new what ifs, alternative frames. Unless there is a map and a clear methodology, then one will just have a variety of different experiences. All these various experiences that have been reported from NDEs, near-death experiences, alien abductions, alien encounters, uh, sexual ecstasy, I believe all of these experiences, in fact, are fractals. If we understand the concept of fractal geometry, no matter how small it is, it contains everything that is in the larger picture. And thus, that validates profoundly all these various experiences. 
discount the phenomenon as a hallucinatory or imaginary, I think it's maybe more useful to look at a mechanism of action. You know, if it is real, then perhaps how does it work? Look, there's extraordinarily regular phenomena that come up with these things that are clearly linked in many ways to these larger human issues around mysticism or religious experience or encounters with other entities. And here we have it. And if you can't go in there and really go in there and account for this material inside your neuroscientific framework, it, you're leaving a huge gap. You got to account for this stuff the way you got to account for dreams, the way you got to account for all sorts of psychoactive responses. Using DMT as an explanatory model as kind of the mediator between our consciousness and a, and a consciousness of a non-corporeal sort of reality, you know, it's handy. With DMT, there are no words. I would try to wrap um, mathematical vocabulary around the experience afterwards. I specialized in the metaphor of vibration and how vibrations in fluids created form in fluid, and that would be the key to the relationship between the spiritual realm and the ordinary realm. This was the window that was opened by DMT. Using psychedelic drugs or other types of pharmacological substances can help to induce a state where people feel that they touch a deeper sense of reality, where they understand reality on a more fundamental level, and they gain a great deal of insight and knowledge into the ways in which the world works and how they are, as a human being, supposed to relate to that world. DMT is somehow, it seems to me in my experience, uh, more of a breakthrough than LSD mushrooms, peyote, and, and so on. It's instructive. It's more supportive of future evolution and the creation of the future. And it is, in itself, more of a mystery. How could this little stuff produce something that has intelligence, you know, that, that is actually a doorway to another reality? So what is the nature of reality and what is the nature of how we as human beings experience it? Can we understand it better? Uh, are we capable of understanding reality on some very fundamental levels? And what do we need to do in order to prepare for that? You know, there are parallel universes, it seems, at least that's a theory in modern physics. There is, is dark matter, which is uh, a huge amount of the matter of the universe, maybe 95% or more. As radical an idea, it's just a logical extension in some ways of uh, instead of using a machine to see more than we normally can see, we're using the brain. There are fields which are undiscovered so far, which have nothing to do with anything that is discovered so far. The gravitational field, you know, was unknown before the year 1604. The electromagnetic field, unknown before the year 1830 or something. All of these, what we call the fundamental fields of mathematical physics, are new discoveries. Dark energy is of even newer discovery, and beyond that are maybe more discoveries yet coming beyond our cosmos itself, in higher dimensions, as they say. I still don't have very much use for the concept of God, but I do believe that there are higher levels, uh, transcendent levels of reality, and I'm actually now starting to really believe that um, the brain is not the source of consciousness, is not really who we are, but it's more like a radio tuner for something way bigger. Are these experiences, spiritual experiences, or otherwise, are they created by physiological processes are, or is the brain itself responding to something that's going on? And the fact that somebody may actually find a way of turning on their brain to spiritual experiences, again, I mean, I'm not sure that that necessarily diminishes the reality or the realness of what those experiences are about. If the pharmacology or the psychopharmacology of psychedelic experiences turned out to be essentially the same as religious or spiritual experiences, it would help us to understand where these experiences are occurring within the human brain. I'm actually quite, quite convinced that we're probing 
the biological basis of moral and ethical behavior. I think these primary religious experiences really are at the bedrock of the uh, world's religions. The research and knowledge and speculation about the pineal body and DMT is in fact the hand of God that is interacting with our natural evolution to stimulate and accelerate the process of redemption of individual and of collective global enlightenment. Because of my ayahuasca experiences, I consider myself a uh, spiritual person. I know things now that I could never have known otherwise. This experience is so familiar for a lot of different people and is so easily acquired and so much information comes with so little effort that it is a kind of a miracle. It's a miraculous way for us to transcend ordinary reality and obtain maybe an intimation of what's necessary for uh, survival. Ranging from new forms of medical treatment to a better understanding of the universe to life-changing spiritual revelations, these natural tools offer us the ability to seek greater knowledge, tools that could positively affect life on our planet. Let's answer Dr. Strassman's question. If so, so what? Because of the collapse of consciousness, spiritual and scientific knowledge split apart. Both these modes of knowing have to come together. In other words, science and technology, from a traditional religious perspective, is not an extra. It is part of the process by which humanity is going to evolve into its next stage. How do we find like the right form for psychedelics in the future? I mean, assuming that psychedelics are part of the human future, right? For that, the mo at the moment, they're still you know, generally repressed and suppressed and legal. If that were to change, you know, how would we begin to construct a, a kind of um, system that would allow for, for a kind of rational and mature exploration of psychedelics? I think that the name of the game is to um, show science the pertinence of this uh, somewhat outlandish realm. And it's not just crazy stuff. It sh shouldn't be considered as, let's say, not even worthy of interest or, or illegitimate. I actually think because it's declared off bounds, it just makes it interesting to start with. But one doesn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, and I think it's really important to stay faithful to science. What does it mean? Why, why is there a part of the brain that seems to be, for lack of a better word, a, a god detector? You know, what's the evolutionary advantage to having uh, some part of the brain that seems to, mm, you know, trigger and mediate experiences of the transcendent? The Kabbalah is revealing to us that the pineal body is actually the very edge of the higher dimension that is penetrating into our lower dimension, and it is located precisely in the middle of the brain. I can remember reading about Descartes, thinking that it was the it was actually the interface between the spiritual dimension and the and the dimension of matter, and I remember studying that and as a, a foolish idea from our history. And now it seems actually like a very interesting idea. What we are looking for out there is really in here. It is the doorway. It is the gate. So we focus on the transformative effect of the psychedelic. But it's also true that the reverse is true, that it requires transformation in order to embrace psychedelics. You know, one, it's one of the tricky paradoxes of postmodernism that psychedelics both require and produce a transformative effect. We have severed our connection to spirit. That's what our society has done. It has sought to persuade us that the material realm is the only realm, and the only way we're going to recover is to reconnect with spirit. And I truly believe we need the help of the plants in order to do that.
part of our work is to respect these these medicines and then to change the culture enough that that people doing them can be respected and held and uh, and not everybody um, needs to do them not everybody should or wants to but um, that it isn't pushed to the side and so part of that does involve then research because that's how in our reductionist society we validate things with the passing of the years and the opportunity for sober reflection i think there's a growing appreciation that uh, there may be something to gain from from studying these compounds that there's a lot we can learn and there may very well be treatment models particularly for patient populations for whom conventional treatments are ineffective for whom the psychedelic model when utilized optimally may may provide great benefit. I think the most important thing that we could do right now that would be um, fairly straightforward to do is to ask and answer the question of whether ayahuasca could help people who have drug and alcohol abuse. And given that we know that uh, DMT um, and uh, similar alkaloids have a very strong effect on the same receptor sites that are involved in depression. And the notion that most people, in my experience, who use drugs and alcohol are self-medicating a deep depression or, or an anxiety. I've had permission now over the last few years to utilize psilocybin, which is the active alkaloid in hallucinogenic mushrooms, in the treatment of patients with advanced stage cancer who have anxiety. It's, we're treating the anxiety, not the cancer. Now, you know, psilocybin is 4-phosphoroxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine, so obviously, from a chemical structure point of view, you know, very similar to DMT. Ultimately, what I want to do is see these things used in the way that they were used traditionally to heal people, help people, and right now, helping people come to terms with dying. It changes your whole relationship to your death, your impending death. Believe it or not, you're gonna die. <laughs> and now, with this tool of having crossed over already, you will, some of the fear around that will disappear. Now I'm beginning to wonder whether consciousness may actually survive biological death, that maybe the model that we've been working under in psychiatry and the behavioral pharmacology model is just wrong. It's backwards, actually. That consciousness is primary in the universe and matter is a result of. Utilizing substances like DMT or 5-methoxy-DMT may really help us uh, prepare uh, by, by practicing a transient dying experience. Thus far, we're observing very positive effects in regards to the nature of experience during the session and then subsequent effects on mood regulation and anxiety control, pain perception, and overall quality of life for cancer patients. By and large, our subjects do uh, quite well in the time they have remaining. For those people who do come to terms with it, part of it is a recognition that these psychedelics open up a space that they weren't aware existed and sort of give them a vision of, of what could be past death as well as a better perspective on the accomplishments they've made in life, a better feeling about what they've done in their own lives. But I think all people who have psychedelic trips and meditations and so on are poking more or less into the same higher realm and receiving some information from there. If we can develop this into, this could be absorbed into ordinary science that we could approach with the scientific method and, and so on, then our intelligence, our capability of survival on planet Earth would be increased. I mean, we're a dying species. We live on a dying planet. We're killing the planet, so our disease is extremely serious and uh, therefore we're desperate to find new information ideas and so on that can can transcend we have to evolve and i think our intellectual evolution may be predicated upon the psychedelic pioneers it's so easy to change the world i mean and that's the kind of thing that you can see on psychedelics if you don't get 
trapped in the beauty and awe of the psychedelic experience itself. You know, it's like, it's like looking through the chandelier of reality from a different vantage point. You know, you can, you can now project through those crystals in another way, and it's beautiful. But, okay, now come back, you know, now come back. I, th I think if I ever were to resume giving people psychedelics, particularly DMT, it wouldn't be just a kind of tinker with brain chemistry and just see what's happening. Um, I think um, one of the, th the things I also learned in the research is that um, you just don't want to give drugs and see what happens. That's a little, I don't know if callous is the word, but that's the first word that comes to mind. I think if you're really going to open people up uh, like that, you need to do it for a purpose, not just for scientific curiosity. Um, and, you know, I'd like to be helpful rather than just uh, sort of smart or clever. To my mind are, is this kind of two-edged sword of s simultaneously opening up to the numinous world, to the world of messages, the world of spirits, the world of entities, and at the same time rigorously taking that material into the acid bath of neurology, into sociology, into the ongoing construction of reality. And that the wisdom that, that these things bring is this kind of very tricky mixture of authentic religious experience with gods and messages and, and clear signs and a sort of remarkable mirror of the mind. The curiosity, perhaps the uniqueness of the human creature, is that we live in both realms. We have, we have the ability for, for spiritual experience and we have the ability for, for physical experience. The agenda of, of the spirit world, if there, if there is, is an agenda, uh, is to allow us to experience our full potential and to deliver our full potential. And maybe the choices that we are making right now as a, as a civilization and a society rebound far beyond ourselves. And, uh, I think DMT is a forcible reminder that there's a lot more about reality, the universe, ourselves, the biosphere, whatever, that we, uh, there's a lot more to it than we imagine. Seems our reality is not the only reality. Occasionally the cracks reveal themselves and may even want to be discovered. As humans, we are creatures that thirst for knowledge. We spend time, money, and infinite energy searching for it in schools, in churches, in business, and in technology. Knowledge is power, and thus our greatest quest. Dimethyltryptamine, a molecule with a complex name and the simplest ability to unlock the door to another dimension, and perhaps, just perhaps, our future evolution.